this was a common way of teaching ethics in the ancient world, and we expect that any teacher should live the same way that he teaches. And his actions uh, speak as loud as his words, and his actions are indeed part of what he teaches. And nevertheless, uh, some modern critics view this in a negative way, uh, saying that Paul thinks too highly of himself here, and when he asks people to imitate himself, He's acting like a, a cult leader who <laughs> seeks to have absolute authority over everybody. Uh, I don't know if you probably thought that. But it's perhaps uh, it's a question that can help us look at what Paul taught and uh, how, how, he, uh, how he taught and lived. In several places, Paul did say, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He's intentionally placing limitations on how people should imitate him. Uh, it's only as his life is in agreement with Christ. Uh, he isn't asking him, people to be followers of Paul, but followers of Christ. And Paul's just saying, he's trying to do the same thing. Uh, I'm trying to live out the teachings of Jesus, and this is what I understand the Christian life to be. And since he lives, he's living up to what his understanding is, it's only natural he would point to his example and say, well, I think my example can help you better see what it means to imitate Christ. It makes sense for him to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. However, on one occasion, Paul says, imitate me. <laughs> There's no qualification there. Uh, Paul just tells readers to follow his own example. And so we can ask, is that a fair request? Is Paul asking people to follow him personally in and, and some politically incorrect uh, attempt to exercise control over people? Well, yeah, I think the answer can be seen by the, the most common slogan of biblical studies. Context, context, context. What's the context about? In what context did Paul tell the readers to imitate me. Uh, well, we can examine the context in this case. It's 1 Corinthians 4. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing a number of problems in the church in Corinth. One of those problems he was addressing is that some people were criticizing Paul's leadership. Not that he was an egotistical cult leader, but almost the opposite. Uh, that he was not a, impressive enough. He didn't have the speaking ability. He didn't demand a salary. He wasn't forceful enough. Uh, so even that, there the overall context of the letter suggests that when people take issue uh, about Paul's command to imitate me, they're making an accusation without much evidence. And I think we can see more as we read the context of chapter 4. Uh, Paul starts in verse 1 by saying, this, then, is how you ought to regard us. This is how you should look at us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. So the priority for Paul is not that he's a great leader, but that he's a great disciple. Uh, he's following Christ. He views the gospel as something he's been entrusted with. He's a, a steward taking care of somebody else's property. In this, he's not claiming any authority for himself, only a secondary authority. That's the way he wants the people in Corinth to view him. Verse 2. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Well, of course. Yeah. He's entrusted with the message. He's supposed to do something with it. His boss is going to check up on him uh, to see if he's faithful. Uh, Jesus gave him the gospel not just for his own benefit, but because he had a job for Paul to do, and he cares about whether it gets done. In verse 3, Paul says, I, I, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I, I don't even judge myself. He's saying, I, I don't have to answer to you. I don't have to please you, your ideas, or anybody else's. Uh, you don't set the standard, and I don't either. Uh, I'm not going to be judged by any human standard. Verse 4, uh, my conscience is clear. I think I'm okay. But, but that doesn't make me innocent. He says, it's the Lord who judges me. Paul is the servant of Christ, and Christ is the one who defines what Paul is supposed to be doing 
and it's Christ who's going to judge as to whether he did it or not. Uh, Paul thinks, you know, he's doing all that's required. His, his conscience is clear. But he acknowledges that he isn't the final authority on whether it's so. That's for Jesus to decide. In all of this, Paul is responding to those Corinthian believers who were criticizing Paul for his leadership and his speaking style. You're not the judge of that, he seems to be saying. You're not the boss. Jesus is. He's the only one who can judge whether I'm doing the job. Verse 5, For Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what's hidden in darkness and expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. So, he says, stop acting like you're in charge. <laughs> uh, let Jesus take care of it. He knows a whole lot more about it than you do and more than I do too. Uh, Jesus will bring out everything into the open, even expose our motives, so we can see whether we're doing the right things for the right reasons. And God will praise each person for what they've done right. That's the important thing. God and Jesus will take care of it. And Paul shifts the discussion a little bit in verse 6. Now, brothers and sisters, I applied these things to myself and to Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn the meaning of the saying, Do not be go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against another. So even though Paul's writing about himself, he, what he writes is applicable to his readers. He's spreading it out to them. They, too, are entrusted with the gospel. They're also supposed to be faithful with what they've been given. And they should look to Christ for direction on what they're supposed to be doing. They're not supposed to be trying to please other people or even live up to their own standards. They're supposed to take their cues from Christ. They are his servants, and he will judge them for what they've done. And he says, uh, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Well, I haven't learned the meaning of that saying yet. <laughs> uh, commentators disagree as to what it means, and uh, it's, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's referring to something in scripture, but if so, it's difficult to see what it has to do with the discussion of, uh, you know, what it has to do with the discussion here. But Paul kind of tells us his, his major point of it there in the last part of the verse, that you won't be puffed up in being a follower of one, one of person or another. Now, there's no spiritual value to saying, I'm of Paul or I'm of Peter or anybody else. In a modern context, we might say there's no point in bragging about which denomination you belong to or what flavor of theology you subscribe to. The point is that we answer to Christ, not to human authorities. We need to look to Him to see whether we're doing what He wants us to do. And even though we might try our hardest and our conscience might be clear, we still acknowledge that we're not the perfect uh, interpreters of Jesus, and, uh, and when all is said and done, He's the judge, and we're not. Uh, our goal is to follow Him, and we don't take pride in following particular humans. We look to him. In verse 7, Paul asks, For who makes you different from anyone else? Uh, what do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why did you boast as if you did not, as if you earned it yourself? Everything we have is a gift from God. There's no point in bragging about what we have because we can't take credit for it. We can't brag about spiritual uh, wisdom or wisdom or good looks or anything else. <laughs> we can't brag about ourselves uh, nor about other people. All we can do is be thankful for what God has given us. And we use it the way he wants. But the Corinthians had been acting high and mighty as if they were the judges of what is right and true. Uh, it's okay to seek for truth, to hold on to it once you think you've got it. Uh, but we should receive it as a gift, not as a bragging point, as if it makes it better than other people. But the Corinthians were bragging about what they had and the, the 
and particular leaders that they were following. And in verse 8, Paul ridicules their attitude. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You've begun to reign. And that without us. How I wish that you had really begun to reign so that we might also reign with you. Some people are surprised that Scripture uses sarcasm. <laughs> but here it is. Uh, Paul is saying, this is what you're acting like. You're acting like kings and judges. And in some ways, I, you know, I, I wish this were true so that we would be kings and judges. Uh, but it's not true, either for you or for us. Uh, and it's a good thing, too, I think he could have added. <laughs> I'm glad you're not ruling right now because you would not be ruling in the right way. And in verse 9, Paul begins to talk about his role as an apostle, the, what they were criticizing him for. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of a procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. This is like a military parade where they're hauling in slaves from conquered peoples. Uh, he says, we've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. In other words, he's saying these apostles are superstars in the worst possible way. Uh, the Corinthians wanted Paul to be spectacular by human standards, to look great, to be a captivating speaker, to, to be a take-charge take leader. They were criticizing Paul for not being the sort of person they wanted to follow. But Paul says they're missing the point. The idea is not to follow some spectacular human but to follow Christ. Uh, you know, the apostle might have a big church. Uh, he might not. We can't judge a person's spiritual validity by human standards. In the first century, apostles were getting persecuted and not praised. Verse 10 uses a little more sarcasm. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, but we are dishonored. Uh, you think we are foolish, he's saying, and you think that you're wise. Uh, you think we are weak. You think that you are strong, but the truth is the opposite. Paul might be foolish in the eyes of the world, but he's wise when judged by the standards of Christ. He might look weak, but he's actually strong in Christ. And the Corinthians are the ones who are weak and foolish and acting dishonorably in the eyes of Christ. They, they have it all backwards. And he elaborates then in verses 11 to 13. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world. Right up to this moment. That was, for him, the job description of an apostle. Uh, in, Amer in modern America, it's not always quite that bad, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, but he's saying, if you're looking for apostles who are wealthy and flashy, who look successful, then you're looking for the wrong thing. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you too. People who follow Christ aren't necessarily respected by the people of this world. Now, now we can't say that all disciples of Jesus are persecuted. That would be to judge by external things. Uh, if we're going to discern true from false, we need to see whether the message uh, lines up with what the Bible says. But in Paul's day, it was true that the apostles were getting persecuted. His message wasn't what the world wanted. They didn't want the kind of news that he brought about how we can be given eternal life by a Jewish man who was executed by the Roman authorities. Uh, as Paul said earlier in the letter, it was foolishness to the Greeks, scandal to the Jews. Uh, when judged according to the standards of this world, it was all wrong. When Christian leaders are judged by the standards of this world, it, it's wrong. Verse 14. I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. I think he said that a little tongue-in-cheek. I think they should be ashamed. But shame isn't his main goal here. 
His goal is that they change their ways. Uh, he wants to see that they've been treating him shabbily. They've been criticizing him for things they shouldn't criticize. They've been judging him by the wrong standards. He wants to warn them. Uh, now, the word warn usually means he's trying to help them avoid some kind of unpleasant consequence. Uh, here, it might be that Christ will judge them, uh, just as Christ will judge Paul. Paul's warning them so that they'll have more praise and reward in the judgment. Uh, and Paul says he's treating them as a parent would. Verse 15, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you don't have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. He's the one who brought the gospel to Corinth. He didn't do it for his own benefit, but for theirs. He's, he's saying that there ought to be some kind of natural allegiance there, but the people in Corinth weren't giving him the respect that they ought to give. But here, here again, Paul isn't claiming any self-importance. It's only because he brought them the gospel. And, and because of this, he says in verse 16, Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Now, what is he encouraging them to imitate? He's been talking about going hungry and thirsty, being poorly clothed, poorly treated, working hard, being persecuted. He's been describing how humiliated he is. And he says, imitate me. Does that sound like he's trying to get a following for himself? <laughs> I, I think the context shows that he's disavowing any special status for himself. It's the Lord who judges. He says, I'm not here on my own authority. I'm here as a servant of Christ. And that is what he wants them to imitate. He wants them to stop looking at people according to the world standards and to look at things from this new standard of Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ, he says in other places. Here he just says, imitate me. But I think the context implies the words that are explicit in other letters. He might say, oh, of myself, I am not worth imitating. It's only as I am a servant of Christ, a servant of the gospel, that I should be imitating. If I'm doing something right, then by all means imitate me. Uh, but if I don't have it right, then you should not imitate me in doing wrong. Now, the standard is Christ, not Paul, Peter, or any other human being. And the same is true for church leaders today. Paul follows that. In verse, uh, verse 17, For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach in every church. Paul wasn't afraid of pointing them to somebody else, in, in this case Timothy. He, Timothy also set a good example. He, he, he can help the people in Corinth to learn it. Uh, but here, even in this verse too, Paul again points to Jesus Christ as the real standard. Now that's what Paul is pointing to. Verse eight, 18. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you. So Paul had earlier told them he would come back to Corinth, and some, but some people were talking as if he wouldn't, and they were while behind his back was turned, they were talking against him. Uh, so he says in verse 19, But I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. So he's looking for power. But not the kind of power that Caesar had. Uh, he'll be looking for spiritual power. He says in verse 20, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. That's an interesting concept. Uh, yeah, yes, there will be power in the future when Christ returns. But Paul is saying that there's already power in the kingdom now. What sort of power is it? Paul seems to answer that question in verse 21. What do you prefer, he asks, shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love? and with a gentle spirit. 
I think for Paul the answer would be obvious. He will come in love and a gentle spirit. That, that is the kind of power that reigns in the kingdom of God. But the question is still there. Uh, what kind of power do you prefer? Do you prefer a rod of discipline? <laughs> or do you prefer the way of love and gentleness? Now, personally, I think the world's already had too much of the rod of discipline. We have people killing each other, beating each other. And that's not the kind of world that I would want to live in. Uh, I prefer the way of love and gentleness. And I think Paul is saying that this is the power of the kingdom. There is power in love, but it doesn't work the same way as brute force does. There is power in gentleness, but it doesn't work the way a rod of discipline does. Do you want to be beat up or do you want to be lifted up? Which approach do you prefer to receive? Then that's the way we should live. Father, we do thank you for your love, for your gentleness that you have shown to us in Jesus. And we look forward, we desire, we earnestly desire more of that uh, in our future and in our lives today. Be with us and strengthen us. Give us that kind of power to do your will according to the standards of Christ and not to the expectations of the world around us. We thank you for your love and kindness in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.